Atheist Nomads, episode 90, news for April 16, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, Atheist Nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 90. I am Dustin, and joining me as always is Wesley. Holy shit, 90. How's it going? (laughs) I'm I'm doing good, doing good. And yourself? Ah, uh, I'm really getting into this vaping shit, man. Yeah, got myself a Kanger, got a uh, 30 watt box getting sent to me real quick on the cheap. Mm. Uh, yeah, did you go with the sub tank? Or excuse me, the the ice stick 30 watt? I did. Nice, nice. Yeah, uh, for 30 bucks, I couldn't beat it. <laughs> and that will do very nicely with the sub tank mini. Oh yeah. Uh, the mini goes from like uh, 12 to 25 watts. I think I'll probably stay about 20, 22. I'll be very happy. That's the same setup that Teresa McBain is using now. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, well, good for her. Yeah, I'll be picking up a sub tank mini soon. I'm still just rocking the K funds and occasional dripper on my ice stick 50 watt. I just can't do drippers, man. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the uh, flavor is so clean. It's annoying, <laughs> but the flavor is so clean. All right. At least you have that in there. Yeah, I've the got annoying part. The, the one I, I, uh, I drilled it out big enough on the air holes that, uh, I, I'm hitting that thing at 40 Watts. Fuck. It's, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. That's just too much. If I'm doing that in the den, say editing an episode, uh, <laughs> I have to be careful to make sure I time my, my, uh, my puffs so that I can still see the monitor. And by the time I'm done, the room is ridiculously hazy. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've been geeking out recently, uh, redoing my audio setup. Uh, yeah. the, the mixer I was using bled between channels. Mm. So even if I put myself all the way on the left and say you all the way on the right, there was a little bit of bleed over. Mm. Uh, usually wasn't noticeable, but occasionally it, it would be. And just in general, the mixer was annoying and limiting because it only did two channels. Right. Yeah, it might have eight inputs, but there's only <laughs> two that you can actually use for anything, uh, for, for anything going out. And, you know, with Lauren joining us occasionally, and we've had one person in-house uh, here uh, other than her, uh, it'd be kind of nice to have a true second setup that's being recorded on its own channel. And also, uh, it'd be nice to be able to split you and the guest. And I finally worked out how to make that happen. Mm. And I am very, very happy. I was getting way too deep into how to do it. It was getting way too complicated. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to see what happens. And I went with a very simple approach and it worked perfectly. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I'm kind of liking this. We've got a, a mumble server going on so mm-hmm. we can get more people on there. You know, not really a thing most people have heard of. I've only heard it from gaming, really, but yeah, yeah it's kind of fun. Yeah, and this might actually end up being an option for people who uh, want to listen to us live. Uh, might be able uh, to work something out there. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens from it. Uh, there's there's options, and uh, I, I, am, I am happy to have a, a simplified yet more functional setup. Oh, badass. That cost me nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, what do you have for us for history? Oh, lots of lovely things happened today. Uh, well, I guess I shouldn't really say happy. Anyways, uh, well, okay, this first one is kind of. Um, this day in history, 1889. 
the lovable little tramp, Charlie Chaplin was born. Mm, that's pretty much all I have. Uh, he played the, the, what is it? The great dictator, uh, which was quite the rant on, on Hitler, which is pretty, pretty damn cool. So check that out. It's kind of, kind of neat and all old, old timey. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So let's check this, this next one out. Cause it gets kind of ick. Yeah. So this day in history, 1947. Uh, the Grand Camp explosion kills hundreds. Holy shit. Oh. So, deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, the Grand Camp exploded today, taking nearly 600 people with it. Though we don't know just for certain how many died. Yeah. So, it probably started with all those, you know, nasty longshoremen. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, some of whom really like to smoke, even though it was banned, you know, the year before down on these docks here. Uh, and this becomes quite an issue when 2,300 tons of ammonium nitrate are loaded into holds, uh, three and four on a ship that's already carrying a sizable amount of ammunition as it's heading to another port. Mm. Mm. Uh, so for all you out there, ammonium nitrate was used uh, by the U.S. Army during World War II as an explosive and uh, later as a fertilizer. <laughs> right. So here we go. About 8 a.m. in the morning, longshoremen smelled smoke in the ship while loading the explosive cargo. Uh, two fire trucks arrived shortly after, but it's unlikely that the water would have helped at that point. Uh, interesting thing that Captain tried to tactic by closing the hatches into the holds and venting steam into the holds to attempt to put the fire out. But that super hot water probably just liquefied the ammonium nitrate into nitrous oxide, which is still extremely volatile. Yeah, and <laughs> added more heat to the situation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh. Here's here's what gets even better. Turns out that the, the hold tank between three and four was uh, f- filled with fuel oil. Yeah. Not to mention that when ammonium nitrate burns, it produces its own oxygen. So you can't just kind of, you know, close the hatches and hope it dies on its own. So Uh needless to say, the ship fucking erupted like fucking fireworks, giant shit flying everywhere. Uh, It's just pretty weird. Uh, So... The Longhorn, too, it was a barge that was nearby, was picked up out of the water and landed 100 feet on the shore. The Grand Camp's anchor was launched two and a half miles away. Uh, Windows were shattered 40 miles away in Houston. And supposedly people in Louisiana felt the blast, and that was over 250 miles away. But that's not even the bad part. The fiery debris hit the Monsanto plant only 300 feet away which was completely destroyed and it uh, basically ended up killing hundreds right there. <clears throat> Man, uh, a second explosion was just as bad, but uh, 15 hours later, and it was of course expected at that point. Another ship called the high flyer, another ship like the grand camp explodes after the crew can put the fire ab- aboard that ship out, which um, was loaded with sulfur. And again, Ammonium nitrate, mm. uh, which actually made it even worse. Uh, sources disagree on the exact number of deaths, and, and it's estimated that somewhere between uh, high 500 to 600 people died in, in the explosions. The wounded numbered into the thousands. An exact count of the dead would have been difficult to get because of the condition of many of the bodies. And there was also a number of foreign seamen and non-census laborers. Uh, Probably, probably, you know, Texas read that as Mexicans. Uh, yeah, who, you know, still um, may have been present, but definitely went ac- unaccounted for. So, holy fuck. Ow. Now, for some, putting this in perspective, uh, it was a rider truck full of fertilizer and diesel that took down the Oklahoma City build, uh, Federal Building. Yeah. This was a ship full. <laughs> yeah. Um, you could probably get a few tons in, into the, the semi truck, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. 
but not 2,300 tons. Yeah. Plus un- unknown amounts of tonnage or, or gallons worth of fuel oil in between there. And well, I'm sure the ammunition boxes didn't help you either. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd think at that point. That's just kind of sprinkles on It's top. irrelevant. Yeah. You know, if anything, the ammunition, that's that's just adding some additional shrapnel. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, sprinkles. Yeah. <laughs> Holy Man, shit. Man, this yeah. is crazy. But yeah, through an anchor two and a half miles away. A, a few thousand pound anchor. <laughs> wow. This day in history, Apollo 16 departs for the moon. Uh, this is the fifth of six lunar landings. And this day in history, the year 2007, the Virginia Tech Massacre. Holy shit. It's just ain't a good day. Uh, Swang Hui Cho, an English major and senior at Virginia Tech. Yeah. Uh, he starts his killing spree by killing a female freshman and a male RA, and then takes the time to mail a package to NBC, the television station, before continuing on to a building filled with classrooms. Cho chained the exits closed, then went from room to room in about a 10-minute spree, uh, killing 32 people, wounding 17 more, and uh, six others were hurt by jumping out of the windows to get the fuck out of there. Um, Man. He ended up killing himself after the police got there and uh, were trying to batter the ways their way in. And he was like, fuck it. And I uh, got the fuck out. Yeah. So that package I was talking about, uh, it contained photos of Cho, you know, looking all supposedly badass with guns and uh, a long rambling video diatribe, which he, you know, criticized the, Criticized the rich kids, their debauchery, and deceit, deceitful charlatans. Man. Uh, in the aftermath of the, of the massacre, authorities found no evidence that Cho had specifically targeted any of his victims. And, of course, Cho is described by his ex-classmates as a loner who rarely spoke to anyone. He had a history of mental health problems going back quite a few years. And it was also re- revealed that uh, angry, violent writings uh, in his class in his classes uh, definitely raised a few flags uh, between his former professors and fellow students. Well before April sixteenth, so, yeah. fuck. Well, yeah, and not a good day. He was a senior, presumably graduating senior, and that would have been a couple weeks before graduation. Should have been coasting by then. Yeah, and I, I remember when this happened. I was uh, dorm staff at Andrews University. Oh, uh, shit. I was a student dean. And yeah, it kind of hit hard there. I would figure it hit hard at every college. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the weird fuck actually uh, referenced uh, Dylan and Eric from the uh, Columbine shooting in his mm. video. Yeah. Just some... Feel feel sorry for everybody all around. That's some fucked up shit. Yeah, and, and one of the, the the tragic things here is pretty much every college and university offers free counseling, mm. and he could have gotten some help. Well, I, I know that I know Virginia Tech got a a fairly large fine because they didn't try and help this kid. Uh, the the, the fine was because they didn't uh, issue an appropriate campus wide warning. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they. That's right. The they, uh, message was they sent too vague. Out an email. Yeah, a vague email that didn't indicate that anybody had been murdered or that the gunman was still at large. Yeah. All around a, a horrible, senseless tragedy. Well, so what you got? Yeah. Um. <laughs> Let's cheer <laughs> this shit up some. All right, it's uh, time for a quick break, and we'll be back with science and technology. All right. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. 
You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. And now it's time for science and technology. First off, the bird phylogenetic tree has gotten a much-needed makeover. Uh, Birds have long been categorized by their plumage and anatomy, but now that the full genomes of 48 species from every major lineage has been sequenced, and this is all done by an international team, including more than 200 scientists, uh, they have completely reworked the family tree. Uh, just for, for one notable example, and I highly recommend just looking at the, the actual chart. We've got a link to it. Uh, one notable example is that raptors are not one group. In fact, eagles are most closely related to vultures, and falcons are most closely related to parrots and songbirds. I would have kind of called that on the eagles, though. They're, I mean, they're sure, they're definitely hunters, but they're definitely carry-on birds, too. Yeah. And also, if you look at an eagle and you look at a vulture, and yeah. Yeah, and pretty similar. Kind of looks like, you know, vultures kind of look like a eagle's drunk, old, weird, pervy uncle or some shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, by closely related, we're talking about last common a- ancestor 60 million years ago. Mm. Uh, they, they, with the, this, this uh, mapping out, they have found that the vast majority of the the uh, differ- differentiation uh, within birds was in about the first five million years after dinosaurs went extinct. And there was, all birds have a common ancestor. The first bird that had completed its, its teeth to beak transition uh, 116 million years ago. Mm. And not surprisingly, the flightless birds like ostriches, those split off from the rest, you know, somewhere around 100 million years ago. And the landfowl and waterfowl uh, split off around, now well, a little bit more recently than that, but before the big major split. And then everything else all split off from there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moving along. Uh, the brontosaurus is back. Yay! Uh, yeah. We all grew up with the Brontosaurus as a favorite dinosaur in our cartoons, movies, and toys. And I'm sure we can also all remember the first time that we heard a pendant correct us for that usage since the Brontosaurus had been it's relegated. An apatosaurus. Yeah. yeah, had been relegated to a species within the Apatosaurus genus. Fuckers. And okay, here's what, what kind of gets me with that. The Brontosaurus had always been its own species. It was just an a species within the Apatosaurus genus. Granted, not the full Brontosaurus name at that point, but anyway, uh, that's all in the past. Uh, now, after five years analyzing hundreds of fossils, a European team of paleontologists led by Emmanuel Stoop of the Nova University in Portugal have promoted the Brontosaurus back to its rightful place at the genus level. Bad ass. I'm so glad that the Brontosaurus is back. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and also one thing that's kind of interesting here, hmm. that the demotion of the brontosaurus, that happened more than a hundred years ago. It took a hundred years for people to even catch on to that though. Yeah. Like the mid nineties or so. We when still people had, finally start stopped calling it a brontosaurus. Yeah. Very, very recent. That shows how much faster science moves than the common general perception of things. Maybe that's just like the rise of the pedants. Fucking 90s. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that could be. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and moving to another fun one. Mm. Uh, Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister of Australia, uh, may get a lot of flack from the likes of Jake Farr Wharton and Nick Morgan Moore, uh, but he's finally done something good. Beginning January 1st of next year, any child receiving federal funding for child care will need to be vaccinated. The only exceptions will be medical and those who are members of religious groups that have formally registered objections that have been approved by the federal government. However, this does still need Parliament's approval, but considering that it has the support of the opposition leader, it will likely get passed. I'm 90% happy for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get rid of that re- religious group exemption and then I'll be like, yay. But in general, this is definitely a good, it it can do, it can't do harm. 
but it's definitely a good. Yeah, uh, Australia still has about a ninety-seven percent uh, vaccination rate. Wow, which Way is better than us. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, but they have thirty-nine thousand children under seven who are not vaccinated, and that is an increase of more than twenty-four thousand children in the past ten years. The number of unvaccinated children has more than doubled in the last 10 years. So I'm glad that they're taking it serious early on in, you know, before they get to the point of losing herd immunity. Yeah. And one thing that's interesting with this uh, closing down of the loopholes is these payments to parents are worth up to $15,000 per child. What the fuck? I want to go to Australia and have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Man, holy shit. That almost makes having a kid worth it. <laughs> <laughs> now, granted, that, that money is to pay for child care. So I think that really only works if you really have, uh, you know, expensive daycare. Still, shit. Yeah. I mean, you have the daycare take care of them for like the first five, six years of their life, you know, and then after that, kids old enough to do the dishes and. You know, hey, start doing chores. Free labor. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I might be able to get, get under this. You know, that might be all right. All right. So I guess you either need to get that vasectomy like you're planning on or move to Australia. <laughs> yeah. Shit, I got to call my doc. I'm sure I mean, you could crash on, on Nick's couch. <laughs> oh, man. No, <laughs> fuck that. Okay, yeah. Never mind. I still need that stuff. All right. And uh, <laughs> California. Uh, yeah, you know, we've talked about their, their proposed legislation to tighten up their vaccination laws. And at the time it was looking like they were going to leave the religious exemptions in place. Uh, but the actual bill SB 277 from Senator Richard Pan was passed out of the Senate health committee by a vote of six to two with no non-medical exemptions. This bill passes. California will join West Virginia and Mississippi as the states with the strongest vaccination with the strongest vaccination laws. During the four-hour hearing before that vote, numerous opponents of the bill made claims that aren't backed up by the science, and that was pointed out in the media coverage of this, which was awesome. And some of the objections didn't even apply to the bill, such as claims that would require children who couldn't safely be vaccinated to be vaccinated anyway. And then oh. some even shouted over the committee members, and two actually had to be removed by security. <laughs> and the real kicker here, Robert Kennedy Jr., you know, JFK's nephew, was in town for a rally and a screening of his new movie that attempts to link the Mirasol to autism. Oh, God damn it. This really? is despite the fact that science has clearly debunked that claim and that the Mirasol has been removed from vaccines. It's not only wrong, it's irrelevant. <laughs> And yet still trying to use it to fight this this bill that is much needed. That got nothing. Man, I didn't know that RFK Jr. was such an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is, you know, the, the bill still has quite a ways to go. Uh, it has to go through at least two more committees before it goes to the full Senate. Then it has to go through the, through the House and then to the governor. But a 6-2 to two vote through the Senate Health Committee, that's, that's a good sign. That is a really good sign. All right. So what's going here? And uh, we got one more. Oh, shit. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Tara Hills of Ottawa had long been an opponent of vaccines. It had opted not to vaccinate her seven children. Now that all seven of her kids have whooping cough, uh, she will be getting her kids vaccinated and is encouraging all parents to do the same. And this has gotten picked up pretty big by the media, including by the CBC. Yeah, you know, I'm really happy that she's getting her kids vaccinated. Uh, but, you know, all of her kids are, are down with pertussis. Uh, and she might have infected uh, other family members, uh, other children uh, during this Easter weekend when all this went down. Mm hmm. Man, I mean, come on. But hooray, yay, there's one more on our side. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 
Uh, one quote from her is, it was too late. It's so ironic and I'm not beating myself up for it. I just hope we can use this very painful experience to encourage other people like us to maybe re-examine the issue. And the issue includes her baby whooping. Uh, that is very dangerous, uh, very risky, very bad. Uh, that that level of coughing, it, it can break ribs. It can be fatal. And hopefully they're, they're getting sufficient medical care to uh, make sure all the kids survive. But they learned their lesson. And this really goes to show that the, the whole issue with the, the, uh, the anti-vax movement is the effectiveness of vaccines. We, we've said this before here, but people in our generation haven't seen what these diseases can do. No, they sure haven't. Richard Saunders from the uh, Skeptic Zone down, down under mm-hmm. in Australia, he put out an excellent movie slash documentary about just that. Uh, it's free actually. Mm. Uh, you can watch the entire thing on YouTube or, you know, go to his website and he'll actually send you a, a burnt disc from his house anywhere in the world for like 13 bucks. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, you paid all of that out of pocket. So, you know, give him a little scratch if you want to, but it's a really good movie. Watch it. Yeah. All right. That is it for science. Uh, We're going to take another quick break, and we'll be back with politics and religion. If you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it easy to make one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com using the links on the right-hand side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. For... Politics and religion, we're going to start out with South Carolina. The state of South Carolina filed an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court for their upcoming marriage equality ruling that argued that the 14th Amendment didn't protect women at the time of its ratification. It only applied to race. And since it only applied to race, it wouldn't apply to marriage equality rulings. Now, they admit that interracial marriage bans were unconstitutional, but in doing so, they failed to judge that by the same criteria that they think should apply to same-sex marriage. In the 1860s, the only marriage protections the 14th Amendment would have actually provided was for same-race couples, regardless of the race. And it wasn't until the 1960s with the Loving Ruling and the Civil Rights Movement that separate but equal treatment of the races was deemed unconstitutional. So their whole logic just completely falls apart, but let's get back to the original point. (laughs) <laughs> the 14th Amendment doesn't protect gays because it doesn't protect women. What's actually pretty awesome with this, if that's the right word, uh, maybe ironic would be a better word, is that they've effectively proven Dan Savage's claim that homophobia is the little brother of misogyny to be correct. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, so you got South Carolina that's been, well, showing that they've been discriminating against women for well pretty much ever and well pretty much still are uh, <laughs> uh showing that yeah they want to air all their dirty laundry okay that's awesome <laughs> yeah yeah fuck it all right you want to show that you're a dick as a as a state all right point taken <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what to say i mean <laughs> South Carolina, you're an idiot. <laughs> okay, so anyways, yeah, just chalk that up to ooh, proving why we need to have protections and why Scottish needs to do this really fucking quick. Mm-hmm. Moving along. These next few uh, stories we're going to talk about are all along the exact same theme. Uh, so we, we may move a little bit quick through them. May not, though. Uh, The Florida House voted 75 to 38 to pass a bill that allows private adoption agencies to discriminate as long as it is on religious grounds. And this allows them to discriminate without any risk to their financial backing from the state. Uh, In an attempt to undermine this bill, an amendment was proposed that would have pulled state funding from any discriminatory agency. That was shot down when the bill's a uh, sponsor pointed out that that does the opposite of what the bill is intended to do. 
so then other amendments were proposed to make the bill's purpose more clear, and each and every one of them actually passed. <laughs> so it is now explicit that state-funded private adoption agencies can discriminate over race, gender, marital status, and sexual orientation, just to name a few non-protected classes. Yeah, so if you're a fem- a black female that's single and gay, you're fucked. You're not getting a kid mm-hmm. in Florida. Uh, but So this hasn't passed the Senate yet, but holy shit, Florida, you got some assholes in your house. If white parents want to adopt a black baby or the other way around, they can say no. Heck, they could even say, a group could say, black people can't adopt, period. Yeah. Uh, you could have rulings that single women or single men can't adopt, that unmarried couples can't adopt. Uh, it now it explicitly <laughs> points out that, yeah, it's fair game to discriminate. Oh, that's just fucking awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Now, what will be interesting to see with this is whether or not this will pass any, assuming it is actually passed, houses of representatives have a tendency to pass insane bills that never see the light of day in the Senate. Hopefully, this one is one of those bills. If not, and if the governor signs it into law, I have a feeling it would not do well in court is courts have a tendency not to like federal funds going to support protected classes and some explicitly protected classes under federal law are explicitly not protected in this law. Moving along the, uh, the Gulf Coast, uh, Alabama, their Senate passed a bill that affirms the right to display religious symbols as long as secular symbols are also present. In other words, to keep doing what you've always been able to do forever. (laughs) Uh, This bill was prompted by FFRF's threat of a lawsuit last year over Piedmont, Alabama's Christmas parade theme, which was keeping Christ in Christmas. Obviously. Uh, Piedmont changed the theme, but the parade itself was the same. No shit, the problem wasn't the parade, it was the name they were going with. (laughs) well hooray let's see some secular symbols but all you fucking satanists get out there i want you in that parade too now the the one potentially troubling thing here is that the the wording of it is as long as secular symbols are present so like you can have a nativity scene on the courthouse lawn as long as you also have a christmas tree in santa claus i was more thinking of a darwin fish but okay that it's uh, narrow enough of wording that any secular symbols would make it legal. Well, I would still say that uh, there's a lot of Christians out there that would want their Santa Claus to be considered Christian. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows what Santa is there for. It's for fucking Christmas. And what, what's Christmas? Blah, 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 blah. blah. <laughs> We'll see how this all uh, plays out when people actually try to use it and it goes to court. Uh, realistically, uh, if they go with a very narrow reading of it, like you can have the nativity scene if you have Santa there, it's going to fail in federal court. <laughs> so, yeah, hopefully the Satanists will will uh, play it up. Bring some Christmas cheer. Yeah. Or <laughs> other holiday <laughs> events. That would be awesome. Yeah. And uh, to continue on this theme, uh, it's been amazing this year to see the the attempts to pass uh, so-called religious liberty bills, uh, what should more accurately be called religious privilege bills. Uh, Fortunately, Arkansas's bill was killed by Walmart. Yes, Walmart killed Arkansas's pro-discrimination religious freedom bill. And Indiana's, even though it passed and was signed into law, received such a huge backlash from business that the bill was being changed to not allow discrimination. What's awesome, well, even more awesome, is since the bill now only applies uh, to the government, it would seem to mean that pagans can now have public orgies 
that Mormons can have polygamous marriages and that Rastafarians can now smoke pot. Rasta. There you go. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Yep. <laughs> I, 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 I know the pot smokers were like, right as soon as that passed, they were already applying for their licenses. Yeah. And I think they're approved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's It's pretty awesome to see that like this bill, it's been completely turned upside down. And rather than supporting the batshit crazy uh, far right wing intended purpose of it, allowing anybody to discriminate against anybody, it's now going to make it so anybody can do anything and the government can't say no as long as it's because of their religion. Well, <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to see some p- pagans fucking on, on their uh, capital lawn. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Under the full moon or... Or not. Yeah. The day star. <laughs> uh, you say full moon, I just think of a really pale ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving along, the Iowa legislature had its first ever Wiccan invocation. Mm. Pretty awesome. Uh, but one yeah. representative asked himself... What would Jesus do? <laughs> and apparently he decided it was turn the other cheek, so to say. Mm. He turned his back on Deborah Maynard as she prayed to God, goddess, universe, that which is greater than ourselves. In all, about a third of the legislature boycotted or at least didn't show up. One pastor in attendance spent his time praying for her salvation. Yeah. But providing the voice of reason was Ryan Terrell, executive director of the Interfaith Alliance there, who said, it's disingenuous for some legislators and conservative religious groups to create a public outcry against a minority religion when they often cry wolf about their own religious rights being under assault. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of invocations, uh, just a couple of days ago now, uh, our very own Robert Ray... Uh, you can go back into the archives and listen on episode 34. Uh, just gave the invocation at uh, the Washington State House of Representatives. He's a humanist celebrant and a really fucking amazing guy and spiffy bow tie wearer. So fucking hey, congrats, Robert. Yeah. Yay. Well, heck, I think I should just plug in the, the audio of that right here. All right. The innovation today will be offered by Robert... Ray, humanist celebrant, Granite Falls. Thank you. I would like to open this invocation by asking that everyone look around you. Beside you, in front of you, and behind you is a person that is in so many ways the same as you. We may have different backgrounds and beliefs. We may come from different ethnicities and religions. But when it comes down to it, we are all sharing the same speck of dust floating through this vast and wondrous universe. Many have come before this chamber to speak of their faith. But I would instead like to speak of trust, of trust in humanity, trust in the fundamental goodwill within people, trust that we all learn, yearn to make the world a better place, trust that some can answer a higher calling, a calling many of us have in common. That is to serve our fellow humans to the best of our ability. I have trust that everyone in this chamber has felt this or you would not be here. With that being said, I also ask that you use your trust in the same way I have described. Reach out to one another. Try to understand and have empathy with those you may disagree with. Make an honest attempt at compromise, for that is what our secular government is based on. With today being the 272nd birthday of Thomas Jefferson, I felt I should honor his memory with a quote. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, as he who lights a taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So thank you for this opportunity to bring my message of trust, humanity, and humanism into this chamber. And I will end with a simple phrase, E Pluribus Unum. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed uh, Robert's invocation. Uh, at the Mormon Church's biannual conference, uh, there are two surprising things that happened. It wasn't their vote in support of opposite sex marriage. Uh, th- at that point, it's kind of redundant to keep doing that over and over again. Uh, it was the Mormon president, Thomas Monson, 
missing the opening address, since at 87 years of age, he decided to limit the number of times he spoke. Monson also recently missed an appointment that he had with the president. Wow. But even more surprising than that was the standard ceremonial vote of support for the leadership where everyone is supposed to quietly raise their hand. Instead, five people stood up and yelled, opposed. Wow. Man, if there is ever a time for sheeple, it's that time. And you got five people standing up for opposed. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, this was five out of 200. This is five out of 20,000. Holy shit. But still, that's never happened before. <laughs> this drew gasps from surprised attendees. <laughs> well, it's worth a chuckle for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> According to a seminar at the NRA convention, Detroit suburb Dearborn in uh, the state of Michigan has been taken over by Muslim extremists and Sharia is the rule of law. Uh, this included, you know, such statements uh, with the the uh, with Steve Tarani claiming that he witnessed this personally doing a ride along with the Detroit Metro SWAT. Yeah, that the SWAT won't even go into some areas. Yeah, and there's fucking Arabic written traffic signs out everywhere. Uh -huh. Like, you know, if you see a stop sign, it's going to say whoa, 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 or some bullshit. You know, right. No English, it's all Arabic. Uh, yeah. There's yellow signs posted along the edges, and you know, he, he said, Jeremy said to me, this is it, we don't go past this line. And I said to Jeremy, what do you mean? You guys are Detroit Metro. You're the SWAT team. You can go anywhere you want. What if you get a call to go over there? He said, this is it. It's hazardous for our team to go past this line. He went on right. to say, I've seen it with my own eyes, witnessed it in the backseat of a car. And it is for real. No-go zones exist in the United States. I want to double face palm myself, and then I want to just smack him upside the head. Yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, unfortunately for fear mongers, but fortunately for everybody else, this isn't the case. Uh, the mayor of Dearborn finds us all very offensive. I should hope so. <laughs> mayor Jack O'Reilly, not a very Arab-sounding name. Uh, well, you know, he married in, so. <laughs> uh, Dearborn is just oh. a typical suburb with a population that's about 30% Muslim, and it happens to have quite a few bilingual business signs, not street signs, and it's a place where you can get some really good Middle Eastern cuisine. Ooh. You know what? You go into any major town, you're going to see fucking, uh, I don't know if this is PC or not to say anymore, but fucking Chinatown. Yeah. You're going to see the Asian area. You're going to, you might see a, a Russian or Slavic area. Uh, if you're lucky, you might see a Polish area for you know, really good food. Yeah. Oh, uh, when I was in Seattle so just a couple what? of weeks ago, I saw, uh, neighborhoods where everything was bilingual, English, Chinese or English, Vietnamese. Yeah. In Boise, there are pl stores that have, the names in English and Arabic. And that's Boise, Idaho. Doesn't get much more American than that. Yeah. Uh, just because somebody's got a bilingual business sign. Oh, heck, you go to at least any city in the Western U.S., you will find carnicerias where the name of the business and a lot of the stuff inside is all bilingual. English, Spanish. You talking about taco trucks? Uh. Technically, meat markets. Oh, uh, okay. Little grocery stores. Okay, okay. Often with a, a nice little restaurant inside. Mm. Now, there's one right next to where I worked when I lived in Everett that I'd walk over to every now and then. Their tacos were so good. Got one a few blocks away. Yeah. You know, weird little grocery store. And then it has the best carne asada tacos. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Bunch of cilantro, bunch of onions, bunch of lime. Oh, oh. <sighs> Yeah, I'm hungry. Sue me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving along. On March 26, police received an anonymous tip about the unreported death of a two-year-old boy from a week prior. 
What the police found is that members of the Congregational Pueblo de Dios Church in near Dallas, Texas, a Hispanic evangelical Protestant church that meets in someone's home, had starved a two-year-old boy that they believed to be demon-possessed for 25 days. Then after he died, they attempted to resurrect him with a rising ceremony, and when that failed, parents took the corpse and fled to Mexico. The church's secretary, Araceli Meza, uh, presided over the ceremony that included praying, speaking in tongues, and anointing the body with oils. And she's been charged with injury to a child by omission. Motherfucker. Omission? No. Well, she wasn't directly involved in killing him. Uh, if the police can get a hold of the parents... Hopefully, they will be facing manslaughter or murder charges. Yeah, but it's not injury. <sighs> there needs to be something stronger. That's my thought. Well, at the point she got the child, he was dead. He was mm. already dead. She could have, should have just reported it. Uh, mm. But no, no, no. Had to pray over That's, his body and try to reanimate him. That still seems like she should be an accessory. She didn't call it in. Oh, yeah. Uh, one thing here that's, that's really pretty uh, crazy to think about is two-year-olds make weird noises. They act funny. They are uh, funny. Funny looking. They make weird sounds. They're, they're still learning. Really weird. They call it the terrible twos for a reason. You get very strange erratic behavior. It's totally understandable that you could see the kind of behavior that a two-year-old makes and think it's demon possession. <laughs> However, you would think everybody would know that's a two-year-old being a two-year-old. And you know what? When you start for a couple days, you start acting even more weird. Go figure. Yeah. Everybody involved with this should rot in prison. Oh, yeah. Because it is absolutely mind-boggling to think that somebody could believe that a two-year-old was demon-possessed. It was the pastors who apparently convinced the parents that the boy was possessed. Hadn't those pastors ever seen a, a two-year-old before? <laughs> God damn. Yay for happy news. <sighs> All right. Well, we've got some, uh, some feedback. Uh, we got a voicemail from Travis. It's been a while. It's Travis McGee from Oklahoma. I just wanted to say I'm glad to hear that you guys are putting my nuclear bomb fusion powered money to good use finally. And uh, hopefully that's buying you guys some good quality beer as well. Uh, you guys keep it up. I really enjoyed this last show where you all got together there in the uh, Kitsap area. Had like five of you guys at once. Great podcast. Appreciate it very much. And uh, as all the well, Christian nutso jobs around here would say, uh, have a blessed day. <laughs> Fucking A, man. <laughs> yeah, Travis, oh, thank yeah. you very much for your continued support. It's definitely appreciated, and holy shit, that live recording was so much fucking fun. Yeah, that was. <laughs> it was amazing oh, just the two of us being in the same time zone, let alone the same room. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'll tell you what, it was kind of scaring me what Paul was doing with his nuts. Just saying. <laughs> what? <laughs> hey, you were on the other side of the table. You yeah. Know, just, yeah. Kind of felt a little sorry for for rich over there but mm. yeah yeah it smelled weird after a while uh anyway uh <laughs> yeah yeah travis thank you very much for the, the the kind words um and yes we are putting it to good use and uh and unfortunately with the uh upcoming nuptials i am sacrificing good beer now for good beer at the wedding all right well understandable yeah because wedding yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so if yeah, if you want to get in touch with us, you can all email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. You can call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666, just like Travis did. You can tweet us at Atheist Nomads or hit up our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else you find the show. Don't forget, pimp us out to your friends. Hey, we love the love the word of, word of mouth bullshit stuff going on. Yeah. yeah. 
And we got a new bronze sponsor, Peter. Peter. Hey, thank you. Fucking A. It's much appreciated, man. Yeah. And, and we helps. are, unfortunately, uh, in spite of, of getting a new sponsor, we you know periodically do lose uh, patrons. And uh, we are, are moving backwards on the 100 by 100 challenge. <laughs> Oh, we are now down yeah. to twenty nine dollars per episode. The goal was to get to a hundred dollars per episode by episode one hundred. <laughs> it's not looking good, guys. It's not looking. No, it's good. not. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! All right. So, but yeah, we 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 put a lot of time and effort into uh, doing this show, and you spend a lot of time listening to us. Uh, if you feel that that time is is worth money. Um, consider shooting us a dollar an episode. If you like us all up in your ear holes, then please, you know, give us a cafe a lot worth of, of your money a month. That'd be awesome. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, uh, shall we just say it? We're going to be on an upcoming episode of the imaginary friend show. Uh, the first one's actually out. Is it really? Episode 244, uh, we are on that for the game show, and we will be on episode 245. Sweet. Jake really likes my voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Link that in the show notes? Yes. All right. All right. Well, thank you all very much for listening, and we will be back at you next week with an interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.